Coming up on this week's show, Addison Albright is here as part of the 2017 GRL blog tour, and Lisa from The Novel Approach talks banned books. Welcome to the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for readers and writers of gay romance fiction. If you can read it, write it, watch it, or listen to it, these two guys are going to talk about it. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Adams and Will Knauss. Welcome to episode 103 of Jeff and Will's Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamswrites.com. And I'm Will from willknauss.com. This week's episode is brought to you in part by listeners just like you. We'll have more information on how you can help support this show in just a few moments. Welcome back. Here we are. Another week, another episode. Indeed. That's become our thing. It's like, it it reminds me of the opening of like, Kiss Me Kate. (laughs) Another opening of another show. (laughs) Or another show, another opening. It's not like that at all. (laughs) Well, it's not, but it's what I think of when you say it. (laughs) Um, This week's episode, everyone who is listening, is recorded a couple of days early. We are actually finishing up a trip down south. We are exploring other environs for a possible move next year. You heard it here first. And we are also going to go see a show. Um, I'm sure we will tell you all about it next week. Absolutely. So we won't (laughs) give away too much right now. (laughs) So, uh... As we do every single week, we want to take a quick moment to thank everyone who has joined us on Patreon. Um, You can help support the Big Gay Fiction Podcast with a monthly pledge through Patreon. For as little as 25 cents an episode, your pledge helps pay the costs of producing and distributing this podcast. Now, for those fans who pledge at the silver and gold levels, you'll have the exclusive opportunity to ask questions of some of our upcoming guests. And all patrons have the option to have a personalized thank you sent directly to them. From us to you. Direct into your (laughs) mailbox. Snail mailbox, no less. Now, any month we have pledges that cover our monthly production costs, we'll produce a bonus episode, especially for our patrons. And you can get all of the details on our Patreon page. Just go to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash biggayfictionpodcast. Yes. And just a reminder, this week on the 30th, uh, it's International Podcast Day. What? Yes, yet yet again, because there is such a thing as International Podcast Day. So... If you want to give any love to any of the podcasts you listen to, it might be a nice day to do it on International Podcast Day. Yeah. Which is also the day that uh, the podcast awards come out. So by the time we record again, we'll actually know if we picked up an award or not for our nomination. How crazy would that be? That would be so crazy. Indeed. You 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 win best award for being a great guy. Oh. <laughs> You win an award for being best husband. Oh, thank you. And the podcast audience is going, oh my god, what are they doing? <laughs> They've become really sappy all of a sudden. Uh, well, let's, let's talk current events. Let's do so. Yes, it is Banned Book Week, uh, which is an annual week that the American Library Association does to highlight banned books. And this year it runs from September 24th through the 30th. Now, the theme for this year is... Uh, the Banned Books Week, is Words Have Power, Read a Banned Book. And that's based on the idea that the words in the banned books, the banned and challenged books, have the power to connect readers to literary communities and other diverse perspectives. Now, this past year, 323 challenges were received, uh, or were recorded by the Office of Intellectual Freedom. These came mostly from media reports or voluntary reporting. It's expected um, most challenges go unreported. Yeah, so you can imagine if there's 323, there's probably easily way too double, many. triple, or that. I mean, 323 was too many anyway. Yes, it was. Uh, among the ten top ten challenge books of 2016 were six that were challenged for having LGBT characters or sexual experimentation. Uh, others on the list were challenged mostly for uh, either sexually explicit scenes or offensive language. And it really is a lot of children's and YA books that get the most most challenges because parents will rise up and say, I don't want my kids reading about this. And I think in this day and age where there's so much diver- uh, divisiveness in the country anyway, it's really sad that these books are getting pulled off shelves where kids 
and teenagers can get at them and really find these diverse perspectives. It, it's sad. Mm-hmm. Um, and according to the, uh, who is the OIF again? The Office of Intellectual Freedom, 10% of the reports lead to books being removed from their shelves. Mm-hmm. Now, of the banned books on the list, Jeff has read Two Boys Kissing by David Le- Levithon, and I know you love this book to pieces. It's one of my favorites. I know. I mean, I love his books to death anyway, but Two Boys Kissing in particular was a stunning book. It's based on a real-life event that happened mm-hmm. uh, shortly after, um, I believe it was Tyler Calente who mm-hmm. jumped off the yes. bridge? Yes, he did. Yes. Yeah. And uh, this protest actually happened where these two boys kissed for an enormous amount of time. And the book itself not only features that event, but has uh, like this chorus of gay men who are essentially past uh, activists who have now passed on, looking at what the next generation is doing to keep the activism up. It's a really powerful book that I can't recommend enough. And, and shame on anybody who tries to get it banned, man. <laughs> It's wrong. <laughs> now, not too long ago, you talked to Lisa, and she had some uh, words to say about Band Book Week. Yes, she does, because uh, her blog, The Novel Approach, uh, takes on Band Book Week as one of their big weeks each year, where they do posts about band books, authors talk about uh, the issues around banning books, her reviewers look at books on the list. And it's really great. And so she starts up this week as well. So let's talk to her. She's got a couple of great book recommendations as well. So I'm pleased to welcome back Lisa from The Novel Approach to the podcast. Good to see you. Good to see you again, too. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah. Happy fall. Thank you. I'm (laughs) telling you. It was a fast summer. I'm not sure I'm quite ready for it yet. But yeah, we're starting to see signs of it here in the Midwest already. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Nice. I like the cooler weather for sure. sure. Oh, same, same, yeah. So, and of so, course, fall, fall brings, brings around Band Book Week, which is running does. this week. Tell us what you've got going on for that and, and why you focus so much on this week. Yeah, well, Band and Challenge Books Books Week is uh, it's spearheaded by the American Library Association and the Office of Intellectual Freedom, Freedom and it's running, uh, like you said, uh, the 24th. It began yesterday. It's running the 24th through the 30th of September. And uh, essentially what this is is uh, uh, the American Library Association coming together and celebrating the written word and fighting censorship. Um, the, the top 10 banned and challenged books or, or most challenged books, I should say of 2016 of the top 10, uh, top, the top five included LGBTQ characters. And so, uh, you know, this is something that, uh, that I feel, uh, really passionate about, uh, in, uh, in all platforms, um, the American Library Association fights for the right for for everything from the Bible to Harry Potter to be on library shelves. Um, They realize that not all content is palatable to every reader, but they do feel that a diversity of books is integral for, for everyone to be able to have access to. Whether you agree with the content or not, it needs to be accessible because for every book there is a reader. So, uh, For the week, uh, we are going to be doing a celebration at the Novel Approach where uh, I have asked authors to contribute uh, ebooks and putting together or have put together uh, virtual gift baskets. So throughout the week, we are going to be doing giveaways for readers and basically just uh, celebrating the power of the written word and and our freedom to access those books uh, for ourselves and not only for ourselves, but for our children as well, because uh, so many of the books are challenged by parents because they don't want their children to have access to them. And therefore, in, in their minds, if their children can't have access to them, no children should have access to them. And, and that's something that I feel very passionate about about uh, that in, in terms of my own children, I'm more than happy to to monitor and recommend what children should not read. And I don't feel that I need to have a consciousness pol- policed by uh, a, another parent who's who does not want their child to have access to that book. So this is something that I've always been super, super passionate about because my kids have always been uh, really passionate about books and reading. And, uh, and, and I, I feel, I feel real, real, uh, 
I, I want to advocate for for what they do and and how important librarians are uh, the celebration of librarians for for fighting for for these books to be on the shelves and for kids to have access to books that include children who look like them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I that's that's something I think everybody deserves to be able to pick up a book and go, oh, you too. That's me. You know, so so we'll be celebrating that during the week of the 24th through the 30th. And I hope that uh, everybody will will tune in this week and, uh, and and give a look at what we have up for grab. Yeah, that's going to be yeah, exciting. Be- we 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 had you we had on you last on year last talking year. about it as well. Uh, yes, uh, it's, it's a great it's a cause great to continue to advocate because we see all the time librarians, librarians are being forced to forced. remove things from their shelves. Exactly, exactly, and and so much of it is parental pressure for for folks who don't want their child to 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 run across a book on a bookshelf. And, uh, and and again, I just uh, I, I feel real passionate about the fact that uh, it's kind of the, the dog in the manger sort of scenario. Just because you don't want it doesn't mean no one else should have it. You know, um, uh, you you know, to stop being the gatekeepers of of other people you know, ideas and thoughts. And so so yeah yeah, it's it's a real 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 passion of mine. So I'm glad to be able to celebrate it again this year. Yeah, we're yeah, certainly we're glad sure. to tell our, tell our, our listeners about it again as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of people, I don't even know, uh, there are a lot of folks who didn't even realize it was a thing, you know, the the banned books and the challenge books. And, and so it's good to, to be able to put that out there and, and let people know, that even in the 21st century and in a country where we have freedom of speech and freedom of thought, um, that, that these sorts of things are, are still prevalent in our society. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And we'll we'll and definitely we'll link up to link the, up to, the to the 2016, 2016 book list book as well as to your blog post. Uh-huh. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. The American Library Association Banned Book Weeks 2017. If you Google it, Banned Books Week. If you Google it, it'll come right up. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Now I know you've got a couple of books you want to talk about too. Some fall reading uh-huh. recommendations. I do. I just recently read a couple of really just absolutely stunning books. Uh, one of them is is one of the best books I've read in 2017 so far, hands down. It's Jacqueline Osborne's Axios, A Spartan's Tale. Um, it, it is it, it's set during uh, in you know ancient uh, ancient Roman Spartan times, you know, um, and it's the story. Uh, it reminded me very much if anybody has ever read um, uh, the Song of Achilles. Uh, it, it the tone of that book reminded me very much of Madeline Miller's The Song of Achilles. Uh, it's just a deeply, deeply moving love story between two soldiers uh, who, from the age of seven in Sparta, uh, male children were were taken from their families and put into training to be a, be soldiers. Um, that was the the mission, the life's work of a boy child in that time was you went and you trained to be a soldier and you fought for Sparta and your life was Sparta. And so uh, these two boys became friends at the age of 10, uh, inseparable, and it's it, it follows their relationship through adulthood and, and uh, their commitment to each other um, and, and their bond with each other. And uh, it's just really, really touching, extremely moving, you know, tears, tears, tears at the end. But uh, yeah, just a really, really beautiful book. So so Jacqueline Osborne, Axios, A Spartan Tale. If, uh, if And it does, you know, there's a little bit of suspension of disbelief along with it too, you know, because it's not 100% historically accurate and the, and the author acknowledges that. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, the, it, it's some of the, the sacred band of Thebes, uh, comes into it as well. If you know anything about that particular point in time of history, the sacred band, uh, was, was the army of Thebes, uh, where all of, all of the men were, were coupled, uh, and they were partners. And, and so they, they felt that, you know, when you're fighting for somebody you love right alongside you, you're going to be a more ferocious, uh, a soldier. And so, yeah, it really, it goes in, it touches in some of that. And it's just a really, really beautiful book, just gorgeous. 
Fantastic. Gorgeous Fantastic. love story. No, yeah. I feel like no, I need to go like buy that right now. Right now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really uh, you know, it, it's deeply, deeply romantic. I mean, you have to just really open up that romance loving soul and and just absorb it. It's it's a really deeply romantic and touching book. I just loved it. So yeah, Fantastic. so go Jacqueline. She's going to be at GRL in October. So yeah, oh, so yeah, I'm bringing along my my print copy of the book to have her have her autograph it. I'm so excited about that. Yeah, Will's yeah, been Will. going through a list of, of things he wants things to read want. before GRL. Yeah, I may have to put this one on mine Not so fine. that I can okay. yeah, intelligently yeah. discuss it with her as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I'm a real, real excited to meet her. Very excited. And what's the other one, a, a Con Riley book? Yeah, Con Riley. Uh, her brand new release just came out on September 7th. Uh, she wrote a book about uh, a young man. It's a, it's, it's an age gap, May, December romance. Um, the book is about a young Russian man who, uh, who fled Russia, um, because of, of the persecution of LGBT folks in, in the country. And, uh, he, he suffered a severe beating and, uh, his family disowned him. So he is seeking asylum in England. And uh, the book follows uh, him along, uh, it kind of it gives you a, a very small but very poignant picture of what some of these refugees are, are going through, um, just, you know, hoping and dreaming for a better life on foreign soil and being stuck in, in the, the wheel of politics and applying for asylum. And while they're applying for asylum, it's illegal for them to earn money. You know, they're struggling to, to find a place uh, of safety and in, in, you know, in the meantime, there's just all of the red tape and, and the uh, waiting, the waiting game is really hard. So, so uh, Vanya is, is the young character and he, uh, it, it, he needs to practice and brush up on his, his English in order to um, hopefully make him a more appealing uh, uh, new member of English society. And so he takes a chance. His, he's got uh, friends uh, who he's who he has really kind of made into his own little family there. And uh, and so while he can't work, his friend says, you know, go up and, and talk to him as if, you know, so he he the, he goes over to Jason, who is the older English gentleman and uh, and engages him in conversation. And, and Jason mistakes him, Vanya, for uh, for a clothes purchaser there in a, a department store. Uh, so a personal shopper. And so it's kind of follows their relationship. And of course, then there's the there's the secret that Vanya is hiding. He's not revealed that he's not really the personal shopper and he's he is is a refugee and he has not gained asylum and and so there's that big secret in the background of you know not uh, not necessarily a lie but definitely a lie by omission and so it's it's the growth of of their bond and their relationship and is it, when is the right time to tell this secret and when Vanya decides to tell then it's constantly getting derailed by something else and it, it's just a really beautiful and there's also a, along along the same lines it's very beautiful familial storyline um, that that just kind of helps organically grow Vanya and Jason's relationship, uh, especially for Jason, who's kind of jaded, the older the older man who doesn't believe in in love and 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 relationships, and um, so it just is, it's just a, it's another tearjerker. I just cried so hard at the end of it, but it's just a really really beautiful love story, and um, you know, and it's one of the hallmarks of of Con Riley's work. Work, is that her foods, uh, her, her, I, I said this, her books are just kind of comfort food for the romantic soul. They're not, they're, very, they're, they're just real mature, not that she doesn't give, you know, hysteria and unnecessary drama. Everything just is, they're just very quiet romances that just make you just fall in love with the characters and make you feel so good when you're done. So yeah, so Con Riley's Be My Best Man. I don't even think I said the title of the book. Be My Best Man by Con Riley. Just came out September 7th and it's just beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful another beautiful romance. We yeah. all need it and we all need a little bit of that right now. Absolutely, Absolutely we do. We yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, yeah. thank you so, much, you so for much for those for those couple of those books couple and, of and talking to us talk about Van Book Week. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's always so great to sit and chat with you. Can a backstage flirtation lead to real life romance? That's the question in Love's Opening Night, the gay romance novella by Jeff Adams. Jeremy Steele is a veteran Broadway performer. For his latest role, he's dancing alongside a man he's fantasized about for years, TV star Ty Beaumont. Jeremy knows better than to get involved with a castmate, but when Ty has trouble learning the complicated choreography, Jeremy offers to lend a hand. When a rehearsal kiss turns into something more, Jeremy can't help but wonder what a celebrity like Ty could ever see in a Broadway chorus boy like him. Will a relationship with his crush make it past previews? Or can it become a long-running hit? Love's Opening Night by Jeff Adams is available at dreamspinnerpress.com, amazon.com, and other ebook retailers. Pick up yours now. Now, your reading Palooza has continued. Reading one of what who have become one of our very favorite authors. What you got for us this week? Uh, this week, I want to talk about Cat Sebastian's latest, The Ruin of a Rake. Uh, this came out this past July when uh, we had her on the show. Mm -hmm. Hey, Cat, how are you doing? <laughs> I hope you're writing more books because I loved this one. Okay, so Ruin of the Rake. Um, follows the story of Eleanor, Julian Medlock, and Lord Courtney. Um, the three of them showed up in the previous book in this particular trilogy, I guess we could call it. Uh, they showed up in the Lawrence Brown Affair, uh, and they're the ones who kind of spent an awkward fortnight uh, with our heroes in that particular book. But now the three of them get their story. Uh, quick note... Of course, all the books can always be read individually. Um, I am of the opinion, I personally think it's helpful if you do read them in order. Uh, all of the books are loosely connected, uh, and characters from the other books do show up uh, in this particular volume, Ruin of a Rake. Uh, in fact, the ending sort of uh, puts a nice cap on this particular trilogy where everyone shows up uh, oh, fun. for a, a party at, at a country house, essentially. Um, anyway, so about this particular book. Um, Julian Medlock is scandalized because his sister Eleanor uh, has been spending far too much time with Lord Courtney. Uh, Lord Courtney is a bad boy through and through. Uh, he is the most roguey rogue who's ever rogued. Uh, there's even a scandalous novel that is loosely based on him that everyone is talking about. So Julian confronts his sister. is like, what the heck are you doing? And she says that uh, Julian's not really as bad as he seems. And I like him, so I'm going to hang out with him. So there. Uh, she suggests uh, that... Um, if Julian is so bent out of shape, why don't you take Courtney around with you? And when everyone sees you uh, hanging out with him, they'll, they'll uh, realize Courtney is uh, a little more respectable than, you know, they all assume he is. So that's the plan. Uh, Julian is going to take Courtney out to the opera and to different dinner parties, things like that, to make him more respectable. Um, as it turns out, uh, his scandalous life has actually prevented him from spending time with Simon. Simon is his uh, nephew. Uh, so he has uh, a reason to try and clean up his mm -hmm. act. So Julian and Courtney start spending time together. And while on the outside they may seem like polar opposites, the more time that they spend together, they realize that they have uh, actually an awful lot in common. Um, both of them have difficult family pasts, and for their various reasons, they feel guilty. Uh, and they, they work through those difficulties in very different ways. Julian uh, uh, tries to... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? He creates a veneer of respectability. 
Mm. Uh, he is the most bland and <laughs> respectable guy you will ever find. And that's how he deals with uh, how people perceive him. Um, and Courtney kind of does the exact opposite. He's like, if you think I'm scandalous, just you wait and see. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna be the baddest bad boy there ever was. Um, so eventually, uh, as they get to know each other, uh, they do fall in love, and we learn of their um, complicated backstories. Uh, and there's a, a lot going on in this book. I'm gonna try and just sort of gloss over the surface, but I think. Um, this book, out of the three, uh, really sort of digs into the characters' uh, pasts and the family relations and uh, everything that's gone on um, before the specific um, things that have happened in this book. Um, in in this in the ruin of the Rake, we eventually find out who the author of the scandalous book is. Uh, it's called the Brigand Prince. Uh, That's we, a great title. We end up finding out who wrote that uh, uh, sleazy book, and uh, someone in our uh, cast of characters has a malarial relapse, and one of our heroes uh, shoots the other <laughs> in order to get him out of an actual duel. It's all cor it's it's kind of oh. wonderful and crazy and very dramatic, and I loved absolutely every second of it. Um, he really did. <laughs> it's true. I can attest to that. So um, I I can't uh, can't recommend this book enough. I'm not going to go so far as to say it's my favorite because <laughs> because I felt that way after reading every Cat Sebastian book. <laughs> um, I love each of them uh, absolutely 100 percent for their own reasons. Uh, so I highly recommend the entire series. Uh, I really suggest you give them a try. But uh, for now, I give a big old thumbs up to Ruin of a Rake. Cool. I look forward to getting into that one. I'm still uh, in the audiobook of Lawrence Brown Affair because mm -hmm. uh, I've been detoured while I've been editing and such. Uh, but I look forward to getting back to that and then picking that one up. Yeah. Yeah. Finishing the, that trilogy off. So we watched a movie last night as well called Being 17, mm -hmm. another one that's streaming on Netflix. Uh, tell us what this was about, since this is descriptions are so you. <laughs> uh, Being Seventeen is a French film that came out last year. It is a, another story in uh, sort of the another movie in the coming of age vein. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular movie um, takes place in the French countryside. Um, the locations on this particular movie are really beautiful. Mm -hmm. A good portion of the movie takes place in the dead of winter uh, in the snow-capped French mountains. Uh, it's incredibly beautiful. Anyway, the story itself uh, centers around Damien. Um, he's a young guy uh, at school, uh, a teeny bit of an outsider, um, and he has conflicts with Tom. Tom is a the son of uh, some farmers. They live in the mountains. Every day he trudges, trudges through the snow uh, to get to school. Uh, and essentially they hate each other's guts. <laughs> um, and that is until Tom's mother takes ill. Uh, so in order for him, uh, for it to be easier for him to get to school and everything, um, Damien's mom, who is essentially the town doctor, um, takes Tom in. And Tom... Uh, lives with uh, Damien's family for the duration while his mom is getting better. Um, this is a really interesting movie. Uh, um, it takes a while uh, for for Damien and Tom to get to know each other. Um, once they stop beating the crap out of one another, uh, they realize they really like each other. Um, yeah, it's about... It's about friendship and family. Um, I really, really liked this movie an awful lot. Yeah, I liked just the pace of the story unfolded. It was not in a hurry to get Damien and Tom even into friendship mode. Mm -hmm. Much less I might want more than friendship mode. Mm -hmm. uh, and they do beat the crap out of each <laughs> other more than once. Yeah. Sometimes they drive because like, we can't beat each other up here. Let's go over there and do it. <laughs> And we can't do it in the rain either. <laughs> uh, you're right. The movie's gorgeous. Um, 
especially the mountain scenes. Mountain scenes, whether it's in the winter or the spring, mm -hmm. the spring scenes as well. Um, I thought the actors playing Tom and Damien did such a tremendous job of really running that range of emotions from I hate you to I like you to I love you to I hate you to I love you to I can't be around you anymore. <laughs> um, and the adults in this movie were interesting. I found Damien's mother, who has quite the story arc of her own. Um, uh, her husband, so Damien's father, is away at war. Uh, and so there's a whole side side story to the long distance relationship that he's got with his family mm -hmm. that that plays out there as well. Plus, of course, the movie interestingly is broken down into trimesters because Tom's mom is ill because she's having a baby and it's and the pregnancy is difficult. So you the movie arcs through the trimesters of this pregnancy a little bit too. Mm -hmm. um, but I liked it. I liked its sweetness and I liked. I like the real life of it because you you could just see two teenage boys kind of, I hate you, I love you, I'm going to beat the crap out of you, and then I'm going to kiss you after I'm done. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, I think it is a pretty genuine and realistic portrayal of uh, teenage emotions. <laughs> there you go. That run the gamut. Um, because not only do they uh, learn to become friends... Uh, and eventually fall in love. There's a lot of uh, family issues uh, and some tragedies that they end up having to deal with. Um, really, really excellent. Um, the ending is a bit abrupt. This is a French film, after all. The movie just sort of stops, but I will say that it ends on a happy for now note. Um, while the ending is slightly ambiguous, it does give you an idea of what direction these characters are moving in. Yeah. So, I think we both highly recommend Being 17. Absolutely. Streaming yeah. on Netflix. Yeah. Want to hang out with us between shows? Check us out on Facebook. You never know what we might post. News about book sales, bonus video content, and maybe even a live broadcast or two. Like us today at facebook.com slash biggayfictionpodcast and see what we get up to next. So recently I got to talk to Addison Albright as part of the 2017 GRL blog tour. Mm -hmm. We talk about the books that she's writing, what's coming out uh, soon, and of course there's also a giveaway, so make sure you check out the show notes page too to see what she's got to offer. Today I'm welcoming Addison Albright to the podcast as part of the 2017 GRL blog tour. Addison is a writer living in the middle of the USA with two peculiar cats. Her stories are gay and sometimes erotic romance in contemporary settings. Addison loves spending time with her family, reading, popcorn, boating, french fries, open window weather, cats, math, and anything chocolate. She loves to read pretty much anything and everything, anytime and anywhere. Her book, Till Death Do Us Part, was a runner-up in the 2016 Rainbow Awards in both the Best Gay Contemporary Romance and Best Gay Book categories. Welcome, Addison. Thank you. You had a couple releases this summer. Uh, with the Vows box set, as well as Cultivating Love, which is actually a re-release for you. Tell us a little something about these books for folks who may not know about them. Okay. Uh, well, the Vows box set is uh, four stories, two novels, a novelette, and a short story. The first novel, Till Death Do Us Part, the novelette, From This Day Forward, and the short story, Okay Then are all featuring the same two main characters, Sam and Henry. And their story is, uh, well, it's, it's a second chance at love story. Um, Sam and Henry are parted for much of the story. Uh, Henry's involved in a plane crash. Um, it goes down in the Pacific in such a way that the authorities think they've found the location where it went down, but in fact, they are somewhere else in their Henry and uh, three others survive on a small island. So they aren't found for years. So the story is, is about grief for Sam and him getting over the process. And the emotional arc for Henry is uh, realizing what Sam's going through out there. Um, feeling bad for him and 
then ultimately realizing he's probably moving on with his life and forgetting about Henry. And, you know, that's hard for him to go through. And to make that work, you know, the fact that they're separated for such a long stretch in a romance, um, I began each chapter with a flashback scene when they were apart um, so that the reader gets invested in them, in their relationship while they're apart and is rooting for them when they get back together. Um, it pretty much chronicles from when they first get together through till the day before Henry leaves on the ill-fated flight. And it just highlights important scenes and events in their life um, leading up through that. So there's kind of three stories going on at once there for a stretch. You've got what Sam's going through grieving for Henry. You've got what Henry's going through on the island. And you've got their background story unfolding. Um, and then eventually they get back together and we've got to deal with the fact that Sam had indeed moved on with his life and was engaged to somebody else. And <laughs> mm -hmm. that would be, that's going to be a little complicated. Yeah. That's till death to us part. Uh, then from this day forward, um, I actually went, you know, until death ended, I was happy with the ending. Um, Everything was fine with their life, and I envisioned just, you know, them moving on smoothly from there. Uh, but then about the time, uh, it, I don't think it was quite published yet, Till Death, um, JMS, my publisher, put out a call for Summer Lovin' um, short stories, a collection to put out through the summer. And I thought, well, that's right about the time Sam and Henry's story ended in the summer and maybe I could think up a little bit more drama for them to go through. And <laughs> so I did that. I wrote a little story, giving them just a little bit more to go through and just a little bit more of a definitive happy ending. And so that ended up being about a novelette's worth. Um, okay. Then the short story, it's a real short story that, um, was written for JMS's, um, Love is Proud, the charity anthology for for uh, the Pulse Massacre. Um, and that is just a bonus flashback scene, really um, long scene chronicling Henry and Sam's first date. Um, then the final book in the series, To Love and to Cherish, is actually my favorite of this. Of all, everything I've written is my favorite because I'm a sucker for... Marriage of Convenience, I'm a sucker for amnesia stories, and this sort of <laughs> incorporates both of them. <laughs> it ends up being a wild ride. <laughs> but it features, it's related to the other two books in that one of the main characters, Nash, um, was Sam's fiance who gets jilted, you know, a couple weeks before his wedding when Henry gets discovered. So poor Nash deserved a happily ever after, too. So. He gets it in the third story of that book. Uh, and the other recent release that you mentioned, or re-release, Cultivating Love. Um, I always loved that story back when it was at uh, Loose ID. So it had been a long time, and I wanted to breathe some new life into it because I really loved those characters. I didn't think I was going to do much in the way of overhaul on that because I remembered really liking the story as it was, and it had been a long time since I reread it. But when I reread it, I ended up pretty much bleeding on every single page, <laughs> rephrasing things here and there without really changing the story, but rephrasing the way I express things. Paying attention to what a lot of reviewers might have commented on, I added a whole chapter in the middle to address something that a lot of people felt was missing. And I expanded the ending and added a whole new uh, epilogue to give it bring it more up to date to what the possibilities were today compared to in 2008, 2009 when I wrote it. Now, going back to vows, you're also bringing this out in audiobook. How's yes. that process been for you? Is this your first audiobook? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, it's It's been fun. Um, it's been real exciting. You know, it's something I'd thought about for a long time and I wanted to do it because just reading on social media, there's a lot of people who are, even though I've never gotten into audiobooks, a lot of people apparently it's almost exclusively what they'll do. And just to try and just give it a shot, 
mm-hmm. you know, reach a wider audience. So I put them up for, I started with just the first one, put it up for um, auditions and I was thrilled to get a number of good auditions and I ended up going with David Gilmore. I loved his voice. Um, it's just a real, what's the good word? Soothing voice. I don't know if it sounds like it might put you to sleep, but it won't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just recently, I recently just got the full set of files to proofread or not proofread, but well, I guess read while listening for till death. So probably Labor Day, that's what I'll be doing is listening to that so I can get it out by, I think the 21st is when the release blitz is scheduled. Congratulations. Audiobooks are always fun (laughs) (laughs) when you're doing your first (laughs) one. (laughs) Now you're a GRL newbie. What made you take the plunge and come join us in Denver this year? Oh, wow. Um, I'm really scared to death to tell you the truth because I'm basically shy as well as an introvert. And so it's like way out of my comfort zone. Um, but for the fir- why I'm doing it this year for the first year, um, even though I wrote um, some stories back in 2008, 2009, before taking like seven years off for real life issues. <laughs> Um, So I've only been started writing again recently in my first publication since coming back was Till Death, Do Us Part, which released in April of 2016. So really, I I guess I would have been rushing things to to try and do it last year. And it it didn't exist back when I was writing before. So it's really the first opportunity for me to do it. And why I decided to do it is, I guess I just try, try to boost my exposure, gain some more readers. Hopefully, I don't know how well it works, but I've never even attended a conference, let alone this level of one as a featured writer. So it's scary and I'm going all out trying to hopefully draw in some more readers because I think my books are are reasonably good. They've um, done well with reviewers and like you mentioned the rainbow award runner up for till Mm -hmm. death i was immensely proud of that so um but i don't think they sell near as well as you know a lot of the popular writers and i'm just trying to inch my way in that direction sure (laughs) i don't know how to do it and i'm thinking maybe this is one way to try and help toward you know gaining a few more readers Tell us a little bit about your writing process and style. Judging by, you know, some of the comments and some of the reviews I've gotten for like Till Death Do Us Part in particular, I don't think most people would believe that I'm a total seat to your pants or writer and, and didn't plan any of that in advance. <laughs> but um, I guess technically I I'm, I'm might, might be more of a hybrid. Um, I don't write out plans in advance for the story, um, especially detailed chapter by chapter. I have in my mind the idea of the book planned out, like for for Till Death Do Us Part, for instance, I knew um, overall what the story arc was going to be and the emotional arc for Henry, the emotional arc for for Sam, but I didn't know the details of what they were going to go through until as I was writing it. So I think that makes me lean towards being a pantser, mm-hmm. um, which is odd because in, in real life, I am a total planner, <laughs> <laughs> but I just can't do it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, I didn't know what drama Henry would face on the island and, until I was writing it because it, it doesn't really didn't really matter to the story, really, the overall story. Um, it added color to the story, but the details of what he went through, other than knowing it would have to be a backdrop for whatever stage in his emotional arc that, you know, he needed to be in at that point in the story, you know, the details didn't matter to me in advance. I just needed to work it out as the character developed, and then the ideas came to me then. Mm-hmm. Um and like into into love and to cherish, it really veered from my original plan. <laughs> I uh, originally 
it was just going to be a marriage of convenience story. And I had the first seven chapters written, which were basically setting up for, to make it believable, his Nash making the choices that he made. And it wasn't going to matter what the drama was going to be to, for the two to eventually fall in love up until that point. And I hadn't actually even figured out what their, what their journey was going to be to fall in love by the time I got to chapter eight. And, uh, then um, it occurred to me what I wanted to do. And the story just took an entirely different direction from what I originally intended. Keeps it interesting. Uh, yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a lot that happened, especially in To Love and To Cherish, that um, never would have occurred to me if I was just sitting down and trying to come up with ideas, mm -hmm. um, you know, and writing out a plan. I mean, it, it happens, you know, as I'm writing the story then a di idea comes into my head and I run with it. And so far you've only written contemporary. Do, do you plan to want to branch into other genres or are you happy in the contemporary space? Well, I read any number of genres. I, I like to read contemporary. I like to read historical. Um, I like to read science fiction. I really love mysteries. Um, and yeah, I would love to branch out more. I'm not sure how well a fit I would be for mysteries because I, it seems like you would have to be a planner mm -hmm. to, to write a mystery. Um, but one of my favorite tropes also is involves like time travel. And so there's like a story idea that I've been bopping around in my head that involves that. So it would, the story I'm coming up with would start out contemporary then there'd be some um, accidental sort of time travel, and then it would turn into something else. I don't know what exactly you would call it. <laughs> now you've got a giveaway for our listeners. Uh, tell us what you're what you're offering up. Um, I think in a choice of ebook of anything I've got out there. Okay. I guess easiest. Sounds good. We'll put a raffle copter on our show notes page for the week. Okay and give people a chance to enter and one lucky person will come away with a backlist book. Yeah. Fantastic. Now what's the best way for folks to keep up with you on social media? Um, I'm pretty active on my, my website slash blog. Um, I've got, uh, well, mostly daily I, I post, um, promo for like various other people. But I've also got regularly, especially on Fridays, a flash, fresh flash fiction that goes up. Um, a lot of times it's for fans of my existing stories, it'll be a bonus scene for one of my books. Then I've also got flash fiction unrelated to um, my existing publications. So people who haven't read any of my stories but would like to see a sample of my writing style they could read um, any of that. Um, so besides that, Facebook, um, I've got a page and um, my profile. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and I'm not really active on YouTube, but I'm thinking of maybe trying to do more on that. Fantastic. So we'll link up to all that stuff on the show notes page as well. Addison, we look forward to seeing you in just a few weeks in Denver. I'm looking forward to it. I really am. The Big Gay Fiction Podcast is thrilled to once again partner with Gay Romlet as a featured blogger. You can see all the participating blogs and the full GRL blog tour schedule at gayromlet.com slash 2017 blog tour. Gay Romlet is an annual retreat that brings together the people who create and celebrate LGBT romance for a one-of-a-kind must-attend gathering of dynamic, informal, and diverse fun. Each year, the retreat travels to a new city and hosts tons of events from raucous parties to mellow tete-a-tetes while still maintaining a spirit of familiarity. GRL is the place to connect with old friends, find family you didn't know you had, and meet with both newly published and established authors in the gay romance genre. This year's retreat is set for October 19 through 22 in Denver, Colorado at the Denver Marriott Tech Center. For more information or to register, please visit GayRomlet.com. 
And, of course, we look forward to seeing Addison in Denver in just a few weeks. Yes, indeed. Uh, that'll do it for this week, I think. Yes. Coming up next week in episode 104, Marshall Thornton and Joel Leslie team up to talk about Marshall's latest book, Femme, which just came out in audiobook this past summer. Yeah, this was a tremendous interview. Uh, Joel recommended when the audiobook came out that I needed to, to read this book and we needed to talk about it on the show. He considers it an important romance. So you'll find out why next week. Sounds good. Now, guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next week, guys, keep turning those pages and keep reading. For detailed show notes and the complete episode backlist, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday on all major podcast distributors and YouTube. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.